Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Mithilis Kumar Jha and I am your course instructor for this course Introduction to Modern Indian Political Thought. I welcome you in this live session and uh, will request you to uh, please ask any question or comments or feedback about the course content during this live session and I would like to respond to them as well. Um, I uh, let me begin by uh, thanking you all for enrolling in this course and I hope those of you who are interested to uh, get a certificate for this course have already registered for this uh, uh, course in terms of uh, willing to write the exam after the end of uh, uh, this course. So. Um, Thank you uh, for enrolling and registering and I hope you are um, regularly uh, watching the videos, submitting your assignments and using the discussion forum for clarification of your doubts and queries that you may have. Uh, during this live session what I am going to do is to uh, share with you some of the concerns or the questions which you have raised on the discussion forum and that is related to the exam uh, preparation, course material and so on. After doing that, I would also like to respond uh, to a few uh, queries which some of you have uh, posed on the uh, Google spreadsheet and also um, uh, on the discussion forum which is of uh, you know, uh, general interest. So I would like to address uh, them during this live session as well. And as I have mentioned earlier, during this live session, while watching, you can also write any comment, uh, questions and queries and I will respond as we uh, move along during this live session. So um, I hope uh, all of you are enjoying this course and uh, getting regular feedback um, on your uh, queries and comments on the discussion forum. Many of you are, uh, you know, worried about uh, certificate and uh, many of you have asked um, uh, such questions on the discussion forum as well. So as you know, uh, this course is open for enrollment. All right, hi uh, Priyanka. Priyanka is asking about, uh, sir, essay will also come based on the topic. So basically uh, uh, this question is about uh, the final exam. So uh, in the final exam Priyanka and those of you who are interested you will have MCQ question, multiple choice questions and there will not be any subjective or essay type questions. So um, uh, the uh, nature of questions would be uh, based on uh, your ability to recall after watching the video or going through the uh, course material in terms of PPTs or um, um, transcripts. So there would be certain questions uh, to evaluate your ability to recall or remember. Then there would be a segment where we will ask questions from the assignment. And then um, the rest of the questions would be uh, to assess your comprehension or understanding of the topic or the thinker in this course. So you will get all the questions in MCQ format and not in subjective or essay type uh, format. So um, I hope that answer your question Penka and uh, similar queries many of you may also have. So uh, Ankus is saying that sir your classes have been really insightful and have enriched my political pers uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Ankus. And I look forward to your feedback as well to improve it further. 
So uh, that's about um, uh, the exam or the uh, nature of uh, questions for the final exam. About assignment and certificate, let me um, uh, clarify and I request you all to visit the course portal as well to get more information on this. So as I was saying that this course is open for enrollment and anybody interested uh, to know more about this uh, topic, this course can enroll. But you are eligible for certificate only when you register for this course and you have to fulfill two criteria basically to uh, get a certificate. One is that um, you have to submit a regular assignment and second is you have to appear for final exam and that you can do only when you have registered for this uh, course. Now many of you are worried that you know you have uh, registered for this course but you have not been able to submit uh, the assignment or few assignments in time and you know after uh, the due date is over there is no way you can submit your assignment. So for those of you who have missed few assignment uh, I would like to clarify that you know uh, the assessment criteria is that that um, out of 100 see 25 percent is is kept for assignment. So uh, and this 25 uh, percentile will be um, calculated on the basis of your based 8 assignment. So out of 12 weeks, your based 8 assignment will be calculated for this 25 percent uh, overall marks in terms of uh, grading. And then exam score is 75 percent. Uh, now to be eligible to um, get a certificate you need to have at least 10% out of 25 in the assignment and 30% out of 75 in the final exam. Only when you fulfill both these criteria that is you get at least 10 out of 25 in the assignment and 30 out of 75 in the final exam you will be eligible to um, uh, get a certificate or pass this course. So the passing uh, mark overall is greater or equal to 40 out of 100. So that's about uh, uh, getting a certificate or you know some of the um, concern about submitting the assignment or missing the deadline. So uh, if you have missed few assignments you need not to worry continue to submit and I'll request you all to submit the assignment in advance. Don't wait for the last time to avoid any technical glitches or uh, obstacles that you may encounter. So um, I hope uh, that clarifies some of your doubts about the certificate and assignment. The next general uh, queries that many of you have um, asked is about your um, reading material uh, for uh, preparation uh, for uh, the final exam. So uh, for this course I will request you all to um, watch uh, the videos and I am sure many of you are doing it already and besides a video uh, supplement it with say PPT and the transcript which is already uploaded for each week. So. Um, uh, you can uh, refer to these PPTs and transcripts besides the videos for your final exam. So uh, to prepare for the final exam, uh, these three materials would be uh, sufficient. But some of you might be interested to know further about a particular thinker, about the particular issue or the theme that thinker addresses. For that purpose, you can refer to the last slide of the PPT where I have given the reference. So for those of you interested in a particular thinker, in a particular theme, your uh, advice to uh, look for the further readings mentioned in the last slide of the PPTs and that will help you to develop or broaden your understanding of a particular thinker and the theme. But for the exam purpose, I think uh, the videos, PPT and the transcript would be sufficient.
Now, I would like to uh, respond to uh, a question uh, posed by Anand on the Google spreadsheet. And I hope Anand is here. And let me uh, remind those of you who joined later to ask your questions and comments in the chat box section during this live session as well. I'll be happy to uh, take them. So uh, Anand uh, question uh, is that uh, about you know uh, the contribution of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, let me read out to you. He writes that Hello sir, as we know in recent years, a prominent change can be observed in the interpretation of history, where in the present times. The narrative around the contribution of past leaders is presented is presented uh, differently. For example, Nehru's legacy to India, that is nation building, democratic institution building, secularism democratic socialist economics and in novel foreign policy that is a combination of non-alignment movement and seal is relevant in contemporary time where we see new era of the cold war between the US and China quad formation expansionist nature of naval more privatization of PSU and ETC so the contribution of thought of Nehru in the right context is relevance for development of India. So uh, thanks Anand for this question. And uh, this question is more towards uh, you know uh, foreign policy or international relation. And this course as you know is on uh, modern Indian political thought. But uh, we cannot and we have discussed it while discussing Nehru's. His uh, contribution in shaping India's foreign policy and as you have rightly mentioned non-alignment movement and uh, Panchi was um, a great contribution uh, towards shaping the foreign policy of India and not only India but also the newly emerging independent countries in Asia and Africa. You know uh, in Nehru's time the greatest worry for these nations were to protect their sovereignty. That means they should decide their foreign policy. It should not be decided either by one bloc or the other led by US and USSR. So in that sense, the Nehru's vision for a non-aligned countries or a peaceful international relation or resolving the dispute in through peaceful manner in a you know format of dialogue and discussion and so on, the uh, relationship and that uh, should govern or uh, the framework under which different neighboring states should um, uh, interact with each other on the basis of the Panchi did inspire the foreign policy of many emerging countries in East and Africa as well and his other contribution in terms of institution building or secularism or planned economy is certain, certainly noteworthy and we need to engage with them. However, um, 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 as you uh, have, you know, uh, tried to assess their relevance in the contemporary time, one need to be aware of the fact that, you know, uh, the changing domestic or international context or politics require change in your approach as well. So um, now uh, the rivalry between US and China is there but can or should be equated with the rivalry between US and uh, USSR. So there is some kind of contentious uh, competitive rivalry between these two nations US and China in contemporary world but can be equated with the way world was divided during the Cold War. That's the big question. The second question is that, you know, uh, India, its biggest worry during the Nehru time was to maintain its unity and integrity 
domestically because you know there were apprehension about um, whether India as a nation uh, will survive or not. There was argument that it will lead to you know fragmentation or balkanization and so on. But India have India has proved them uh, wrong, and now India is not only able to contain any you know uh, threat or challenge to its sovereignty, but also it proactively play a role in the global affairs or international affairs and which is being increasingly recognized by other powers as well. So, so to say that the bipolar world of the Cold War is no longer in existence. In this world of contemporary um, time, you don't have the unquestioned dominance of a unipolar world in terms of USA. So um, there is a multipolar world and you know our foreign uh, minister has written a new book where it argues about new approaches, new epistemological change in terms of uh, foreign policy. So I'll advise you to read that book. But limiting my uh, uh, response to your question from the perspective of uh, modern Indian political thought, certainly um, the relevance of Nehru in terms of uncompromising attitude towards protecting India's sovereignty in terms of uh, uh, shaping its foreign policy or the way it should interact with its neighbor or the way it should participate in the international organizations is something which we need to um, uh, continue to um, respect or derive inspiration from. There are his, uh, you know, uh, greatest contribution perhaps and in that sense, um, these thinkers, as I have discussed in the various video lecture, were also someone who actively participated in the um, politics and had a vision for free India. And to uh, save uh, free India, according to their vision, Nehru's legacy was uh, towering in terms of, you know, I am. IITs or various uh, democratic institutions, the way states should play a commanding uh, uh, role in terms of industrialization, development, creating an egalitarian society or a secular framework of governance and so on. So in that sense, uh, particularly our lecture on uh, discovery of India, I would request you to visit. And then uh, contemporary time, there is this uh, uh, approach in politics to appropriate a political thinker or interpret a particular thinker and his contribution in different ways. So that's uh, more towards uh, the political uh, appropriation or sidelining or undermining. But when we engage with the thought or political thought, there one needs to be objective and understand both the contribution and also the uh, failings of a particular thinker or a par particular uh, uh, historical uh, uh, personalities. So yes, there are valid criticism against Nehru's, but when we assess his thought in contemporary uh, times as a student, as a researcher, as a thinker or as a teacher, one needs to be objective rather than um, driven by the uh, political appropriation or sidelining of a particular thinker and their ideas. So that would be my response to uh, your excellent question, Anand. I don't know I have answered it adequately, but if you have any further question and if you are during this live session, you can um, ask further question or you can use the discussion forum also to uh, ask any further question that you may have. <coughs> okay, Anand. You are here. So, uh, Malika Arjun is saying very interesting and meaningful uh, session, sir. Thank you, Malika Arjun. I hope uh, you are enjoying this course and I look forward to your uh, feedback as well. Okay. Umang Mishra, sir, assignment answers are not getting in transcript, so please help. Umang, can you be um, specific? 
because all the assignments are from the PPTs or videos because you know some questions you may have which is on the basis of recall whether you have watched uh, the video or not. So to assess that you may get some question which is part of video mean, and hopefully it should be part of transcript certainly but in the PPT you may not have you know PPT is a very uh, limited uh, 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 kind of resource where we highlight uh, the major points or major uh, arguments of a particular thinker on particular theme. But when it comes to uh, the video or the transcript, hopefully those questions for the assignment are from the videos or the transcript. But if there are some question uh, which is uh, not part of uh, the transcript or the videos, please point that out and we would like to address them. Okay, so Tejas is uh, saying that, yeah, I was coming to this question, Tejas, and you have asked it um, on the discussion uh, uh, forum as well. So Tejas' question is, sir, what is cosmopolitan thinker? I did not understand this concept. So um, Tejas, um, as you know, um, uh, let's uh, um, understand it uh, this way, although I have uh, Partially uh, responded to your question uh, on the discussion forum. So, what is cosmopolitanism? Let's say in life we uh, take major decisions, or our behavior or actions are largely shaped by the immediate concern. Immediate concern means, you know, my neighborhood. Uh, my uh, uh, community and that community may also include you know a nation state let's say these identities of neighborhood community or nation state is somewhat limited both in terms of territory or in terms of psychology so for example we are indian this indianness uh, bring us together within the territory of india but it also distinguishes it from other people, from other nations, right? So in that sense, the imagination or thinking of nation and nationhood is limited, both in terms of territory, also in terms of psychology. So whatever we do, so within India, for example, uh, something happens or we are billion plus uh, Indians, we may never meet each other, but in our psychological, in our um, emotional, being, we feel some kind of affinity with each other, some kind of solidarity with each other. So people in Manipur may extend their solidarity to what is happening in Kerala. But what happens across the border, say in Myanmar, their response or emotional response would be different. So I hope if you understand this concept of nation and nationalism, that limits both in terms of territory, also in terms of psychology or emotion, the cosmopolitan thinking or cosmopolitan imagination is something that transcends the boundaries of nation state. That means you consider yourself as the part of humanity and do not necessarily limit your emotional response to the challenges and issue based on the national or limited imagination. So just to give a, a very general or immediate uh, response or to make you um, understand the concept of cosmopolitanism is to uh, understand it a uh, thought process or an imagination which becomes truly global or cosmopolitan in character, in imagination, in its vision rather than limiting with, within a uh, community, within a nation or within a group of nations and so on. Now, how it works? In the 20th century, there have been a very, um, you know, contentious relationship between the imagination of the uh, nation and nationalism on the one hand and the cosmopolitan and global imagination on the other. So you have thinkers like in India, for example, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, and I will particularly request you to revisit that lecture again to understand how layered his understanding of cosmopolitanism was that he was rooted 
in the cultural intellectual milieu of bengal or india and yet he expanded his personality or imagination of self to embrace the culture language traditions of the rest of the world and there was this also political intellectual response towards bridging the gap bridging the division of the world into different worlds different uh, blocks and bringing them together so east west for example was the the idea of santiniketan was such a idea in uh, say all the philosophy in all the tradition you have some imagination that goes beyond the immediate that means it encompasses whole of the humanity not a particular group a particular race or particular community or a particular nation or nationality but humanity as a whole and then as a cosmopolitan thinker as a cosmopolitan person your uh, uh, response your uh, um, behavior would be shaped by the challenges that we face as a human uh, race or as a uh, you know global citizen so uh, you know cosmopolitan imagination can be seen in contrast to fragmented or particularistic imagination of nation so in the nation you have the competitive struggle right my nation is superior to yours and that has led to a number of wars in the 20th century in 1980s after the ICT revolution information and communication technology revolution or movement of goods and services along with the people across the countries across the culture the world has come together like never before so there is this possibility of you know having a very close intimate relations between and among different cultures and also to respond or uh, uh, solve uh, the collective challenges like terrorism or climate change that is a threat to the humanity and no nation can face it together so what should be our response so martha sinus bomb and you know in this course we have particularly discussed about uh, rabindranath tagore that how at the height of nationalist imagination during the um, um, uh, during the um, indian uh, national movement he was against the very idea of nation not just indian nation or chinese nation but the very imagination of nation and embraced the idea of cosmopolitanism and in um, india you might be familiar with the imagination of vasudhaiv kutumbakam where you treat the whole world as a family so that is about cosmopolitanism besides that there are many other thinkers as i have said martha sinus bomb apaya and many others who argued about that imagination okay so uh, tejas i hope that answer your uh, question but if you have um, uh, any further doubt or uh, clarification uh, that you uh, need you can use the discussion forum and i'll share one reading with you all on the cosmopolitanism okay so dhyanendra singh is saying sir why corruption in politics due to this people hate politics and now it is democracy going to end <laughs> dhyanendra i don't uh, uh, think that we should be pessimistic about politics and we should understand politics as uh, you know um, uh, an arena where immense possibilities is there so as a human being we can be the best that we can or we can be the worst also and at times as a nation or as a community or uh, as a species we have achieved the great heights so in india when uh, colonialism was um and there there was the extraction of resources and all kind of social and religious evils the indians rise above and responded to the um, uh, challenges and created a republic won its independence and set certain institutional frameworks and gandhian idea or you can think of all the thinkers that we have discussed in this course that the approach to politics is not just about power for the sake of power right Uh, politics is to create a society or a community which would be conducive for a dignified life or for a happy life 
and for that you need to bring ethics and morality at the center of political debates so uh, you know in uh, political science there is debate between say normative political theory or explanatory political theory qualitative or quantitative approach to politics and so on uh, those debates a part politics will be in collective endeavor to create a society which will create a condition that would be conducive for a harmonious happy stable or decent life or a dignified life and there you may have setbacks you may have contemporary challenges you may have prevalence of corruption or violence or hate but it also create the opportunity to replace them with love compassion extending solidarity uh, making ethics and and that requires you know participation from uh, each one of us rather than expecting one party one person one leader to deliver democracy or that kind of society for us so politics require uh, participation from its uh, citizen so i have that my response to your question yanin okay akhilesh uh, suri suri sir sir what do you think about giving reservation for women in the elections how will it be helpful in bringing good leadership to the front so at least i think um, this question is not really uh, for uh, part of this uh, course but immediate answer is you know reservation or affirmative action as a tool is something which many societies use to give a representation to those who are under represented or who are you know um, uh, marginalized historically and economically so to empower them or to give them level playing field you have this tool of reservation and affirmative action so certainly um, you know in a society where uh, politics is a male uh, dominated arena we need more women uh, leadership and to ensure that if reservation helps and affirmative action uh, uh, affirmative action self why not we should use those mechanisms and to do that you need a kind of national consensus on that okay tejas is asking one more question sir gandhi ji was against western education and tagore support western education if i am not wrong but gandhi ji went to study abroad so why this dual behavior i think tejas uh, this is i mean too simplistic uh, um, assessment of gandhi and tagore uh, let me give you one example uh, of arbindo ghosh so he went to england he had all his education in england in fact his uh, parent did not want him to have any um, uh, contamination within court or any uh, you know uh, interaction with the indians or um, um, uh, is in uh, civilization or culture you want to have a kind of english sized uh, education lifestyle and so on so uh, despite having such a bringing or education arbindo ghosh became a truly a spiritual uh, figure right so just having english education does not make you truly you know uh, western or having indian education you cannot fight for uh, english education so raja ram mohan rai was example of that now coming back to this debate between gandhi and tagore again uh, with a request to go back to that uh, lecture where we have discussed in details the complex argument that is there between gandhi and tagore rather than you know simply uh, putting one against the other uh, so politically it may be helpful but for understanding for comprehension one needs to go beyond that to understand the complex nature of the debate and uh, argument between um, uh, tagore and gandhi on many points they converge but on many points they uh, uh, differ so um, uh, if you read a uh, same um, uh, tagore um, uh, critique of nationalism or idea of man uh, and his argument uh, particularly about uh, the condition of indian uh, society and politics 
because we have lost some kind of inner touch with our own self and unless we rebuild that we cannot uh, uh, truly become uh, uh, what we aspire to become so the political movement political mobilization by gandhi and congress he kept himself aloof uh, from nonetheless he was a patriot and on many occasions he seems to um, take uh, side certainly jalia balabag was such incident on uh, uh, the notion of uh, say satyagraha or uh, boycott of education or uh, english services uh, or uh, the services of the colonial rule gandhi tagore did uh, differ but both of them had high regard for each other contribution tagore realized it therefore called him mahatma so did gandhi about tagore's vision for future of india and now uh, you know when you talk about the political thought of say gandhi nehru and tagore the difference was that tagore was not as active as gandhi or nehru was were but in their thought in their imagination the streak of internationalism or the global uh, 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 was ever present so in nehru in gandhi critique of western civilization so gandhi was a politician but also a very uh, visionary uh, shrewd thinker who questioned the uh, very premise of western civilization on modern civilization and wanted to uh, emphasize on say um, uh, village or village republic or ram rajya or an alternative approach to uh, politics and way we should organize our nation on the other hand you have you know nehru uh, b r ambedkar who wanted uh, the strong state or interventionist state gandhi had a kind of bottom up approach but in terms of uh, gandhi and um, uh, tagore uh, tagore did support the western education but not at the cost of um, say indian education or indian philosophy the way for example Raj, raja ram mohan rai did in fact raja ram mohan rai also wanted to have new engagement or critical engagement with the vedas or the shastras so um, tagore certainly had a very different vision on education santi niketan was um, uh, Uh, a marker of that uh, vision where he want the ideas from everywhere to um, uh, uh, come or one should benefit from that or his kind experiment in agriculture and other uh, field or cooperative society was such example gandhian approach to education was uh, you know more uh, practical uh, nai taleem and uh, debates uh, around that so uh, gandhi did went abroad but that the uh, uh, fact alone does not disqualify him to uh, to present himself or his ideas as truly indian so that's a very simplistic approach to uh, understand or critically engage with their thoughts and ideas on many levels the uh, converse and uh, they differ where gandhi remain actively and that he um, that he acknowledged as well in his debate between um, you know in his uh, debate with uh, tagore where he says you know as an intellectual when you are disconnected with the real um, um, uh, politics you have certain advantages but when you are in the thick of uh, uh, certain things or certain events and you are embedded in those events then you, your vision may be you know very different from someone who is at a distance so that was uh, the kind of difference between gandhi and tagore but on education on philosophy on um, uh, practice you find many ideas uh, of uh, gandhi and tagore converge so <laughs> this dual behavior is something which is problematic for me so this is that 
I hope answer your question. So, final is ex uh, Deepak is asking final exam 70 marks. It will be objective or subjective, sir. What is the duration and if objective with any negative word, please clarify, sir. So, uh, Deepak, final exam is for 75 marks, and you have to have. Um, um, uh, you have to have um, about um, 30 out of 75. The duration of exam is, I need to um, check, I think three hours, the final exam. Just give me a second. And there will not be any uh, negative marks. And all the questions that you you will have is uh, subjective, sorry, objective in nature. So M MCQ questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, Anand, for confirming. So it's three hour. Um, uh, uh, three hour is the duration uh, for the exam. And the nature of question would be objective MCQ type and uh, there will not be any negative one for that. So I hope that answer your question. Okay, so there were a few other questions like you know many of you um, have asked about Swaraj in ideas. So this text I hope if you are doing this course at some point you will read this uh, very uh, interesting uh, article by K.C. Bhattacharya on Swaraj in ideas. So we got political independence, there are debate about how far we have got economic independence because you know even for food and other basic necessities, even after ICT for technology, um, we are dependent on the first world. So how economically independent we are, we can debate. But in terms of thought, in terms of ideas, have we achieved independence? And in that context, this reading by K.C. Bhattacharya will help you to unravel many thoughts, many entanglements in terms of imagination, thoughts with the colonialism. So you can certainly read this article. You need not to, uh, you know, summarize or submit it for uh, the assignment. But if some of you are interested, you can write to me on my email. Uh, there is some question about, say, why Raja Ramon Roy is regarded as the father of modern Indian political thought and not B. R. Ambedkar. Now, this kind of, you know, uh, question uh, may come. Uh, it is similar with, say, uh, one question about why. Um, both Vivekananda and um, Aurobindo are regarded as the prophet of Indian nationalism. So uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, respond, I think uh, one need to understand such categorization, such statements in particular context. Uh, Raja Ramon Roy uh, was regarded as the father of modern Indian political thought because he was the first who began to articulate the rights of Indian. So, uh, you know, civil rights or political rights or freedom of press or, you know, his support for many reforms as well as English education was something which was unique. Nobody uh, did that before. So, um, that makes um, Raja Ram Mohan Roy the father of modern Indian political thought. B. R. Ambedkar, Nehru, Aurobindo, Vivekananda did um, contribute in uh, expansion or in diversification of Indian political imagination, modern Indian political imagination. You should understand their thoughts and ideas in the complexities, how far that strengthened something or weakened something. 
so uh, you know uh, you should uh, engage more with uh, uh, the contribution of their thoughts and ideas or the relevance of their thoughts and ideas even in the contemporary times as some of the issue like say the relationship between religion and politics uh, or the question of secularism uh, the idea of democracy is something which remains um, uh, contentious even in contemporary politics so how far these thinkers help us understand those ideas so you should be more engaged with such kind of uh, question or uh, uh, ideas rather than you know why one so it's like contemporary politics where you know one leader needs to be worshiped and to worship one leader it is uh, good to sideline or ignore or undermine the contribution of other leaders so um, my response would be uh, to factually uh, uh, respond that raja ramon rai was the father of modern indian political thought and b r ambedkar is regarded as the father of indian constitution father of the nation was mahatma gandhi arbindo was regard, regarded as the prophet of nationalism so the different thinkers different uh, personalities use this you know uh, mahatma gandhi was uh, called as mahatma by uh, uh, tagore so that that's the uh, factual side of uh, the debate but the larger or the bigger question for all of us is to engage with their ideas and to assist the relevance of their ideas in understanding some of the contentious burning issue of contemporary politics so i hope uh, that answer your question all right anand is asking that i requested you to please give us subjective assignments with objective based assignment in our course that help us build up our writing skills and knowledge in political sense yeah that's a very good um, suggestion anand let me think about it maybe next time i offer this course i'll think about it but now since we have already um, decided uh, the mechanism or the way we are going to assess uh, for uh, say um, assignment and the uh, final exam uh, we cannot change that now but maybe uh, next time when i offer i'll take this suggestion into consideration while uh, framing the course uh, for the next time all right so uh, that was uh, all i had to uh, say and uh, once again i would like to thank you all for being part of this course uh, enrolling and registering for the exam and also during this live session for uh, uh, posing such brilliant question and we are going to have one more live session next month so i hope you are going to uh, uh, be with us in the next live session and during uh, that time use the discussion forum to raise your questions comments and uh, give your feedbacks on the course pedagogy and so on to improve it further so thank you very much for being with us today during this live session and wish you all the best thank you